Catastrophizing is a type of cognitive distortion. It's an accurate way of thinking that involves imagining the worst possible outcome in any given situation. So let's say you have a fight with your partner. You can quickly follow a chain of negative thinking which will lead to you feeling that you will be alone forever. Now, it doesn't make any sense as a form of logic, but actually if you follow just a chain of small negative catastrophizing steps, it does feel very possible. So the fight with your girlfriend, for example, or your partner will go into feeling like they might leave you, which will then feel like if they leave you, you will be destroyed. And if you feel destroyed, you will just never be able to trust anybody again ever. And if you can't trust anybody again ever, then you will always be alone for the rest of your life. And it's not going to happen. <laughs> Everything's fine. Yet you now feel like your world is about to end and everything is terrible. That is catastrophizing. Hello and welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast. This week we are still in the series of how to stop complaining and basically start loving our lives a lot more and being kind to ourselves. And in catastrophizing, I think it's just a really big thing. Now, some people are really held back by this as like a massive part of their life. And most of us still do this a lot, even if we don't think we do. Because humans are explanation machines. We constantly make up stories to explain to ourselves our current situation. And most of the time, those explanations do distort reality. Now, often altering our perception of reality doesn't limit our life. It's just a default behavior that we evolved to make us more confident and actually more happy. Usually we evolved this for a reason. We did this because of if you're constantly in a state of panic because you have no idea what's going on or why you're doing it, it's not very helpful for you. So you just come up with stories all the time to just make yourself feel better. However, sometimes the fact that we're such a good storytelling machine where we tell ourselves things that we believe can have the opposite effect. Sometimes we can tell ourselves these stories that we believe that make us panic. They give us more fear. And when we start seeing the world through a lens of catastrophizing, we're really trying to protect ourselves and make ourselves happier. But what happens is we see the bad things and we start to heavily limit ourselves and hold ourselves back in a massive, massive way. Now, a good phrase is that you don't really see what you see. You see instead what you're looking for. And if you're looking for the negative in life, you're going to find the negative. If you're looking for how things will end up terribly, you're always going to find things that feel terrible. However, if you look for the positive, you will be more likely to find the positive. So there's a lot of things that we can do to help ourselves with catastrophizing. And the first and most important thing is to build awareness. The goal with that is to identify where and when you might be doing that in your life and notice any triggers that come up and any habits that you have that make catastrophizing more likely, then you want to start building tools and habits to get yourself out of catastrophizing mode when you notice that it is happening. By becoming more aware and noticing the catastrophizing patterns that you have, you can start to limit the ways that you hold yourself back. One of the frustrating things about catastrophizing is that it is so easy to do because it does just follow a set of very logical feeling steps in our mind. We're presented with a terrible scenario, but it feels completely possible, which ignores how unlikely it is because every set of possibility does have some truth in it. Another example might be with work. Let's say you have a deadline that you're struggling with for your boss and you imagine that you might miss the deadline or that you'll hand something in, but it won't be good enough. So your boss or your client will become unhappy with you. They might start setting harder deadlines on you, or maybe people will start talking about how useless you are and judging you. Then your work will start being judged even more harshly. You'll be called in for like a review. At this review, you'll be fired. And then because you're fired, you won't be able to find a new job and you won't be able to pay your rent. And you'll end up expecting that you're going to become a complete failure within one month. Completely blown out of proportion, yet every single step along the way was something that could happen. Now, having these scenarios that you can believe because they are technically possible is really unhealthy because then you'll start reacting badly to things. If you're in a situation such as this work one or the one I gave with relationships, you'll start trying to protect yourselves. And if you're trying to protect yourselves from heartache from a partner, you might start being harder on your partner. You might be sensitive to noticing anything that they do wrong is bad. You might be very critical of any friendships that they have with members of the opposite sex. And you might pick up on anything they do to ignore you or something. And that can lead to you starting more fights because you're worried about being alone forever and you want them to be really supportive and emotional to you, but they're going to be doing the opposite thing that you want. 
Now, logically, you're doing these things because you don't want to be alone forever and you want to have a partner, yet your actual behaviors are destroying your trust and making the relationship worse, making it more likely for you to break up. And that's the opposite of what you wanted. So instead of catastrophizing, you want to look for the positives. If you are having a fight with a partner, it's probably because your partner actually cares about you and just feels like you haven't understood something. Or if you're worried about them breaking up with you, you're more likely to start fights. It's probably because you care about them. And so there's an opportunity there to realize that you both love each other and that there may be are ways that you can trust each other better and feel better about your relationship and fulfill each other's needs in a way that everyone feels happier. And that's a lot less anxiety inducing and leads to a much better relationship. Now let's go into some psychology for a bit. Catastrophizing is actually the act of magnifying where you zoom in on a situation and greatly magnify the negative aspects of it. Now, at the exact same time as magnifying the negative sides, we are minimizing and underplaying all the positive possible aspects of the scenario. We've developed hyper detail of like everything that can go wrong and we've completely failed to imagine all the possible good outcomes and we don't have any kind of realistic feelings for what good things might happen. Catastrophizing will happen in response to both real or imaginary events and can genuinely contribute to a range of mental health problems such as anxiety and depression and even physical health problems. People that catastrophize will often have a heightened perception of threat, which will lead to avoidance behaviors, meaning that they might miss out on opportunities at work or in relationships or any parts of life because they are too worried about what could go wrong. Now, this can really affect your quality of life. That's why catastrophizing is such an important thing to deal with in your life and realize and try and find ways to make it better. There's two really interesting things in psychology that I think help people understand why it happens better and some of the ideas of which then helps build some awareness to why you might then be able to fix it. The first is that the more detail that you have in an example, the more real and the more likely that it feels. So in a psychological study where participants were asked the likelihood of a act of nature affecting their house in California, they kind of rated it on a scale of likelihood and they kind of rated it quite unlikely possible, but they didn't really imagine it happening. Whereas if instead they were asked something a lot more specific, like an earthquake happening next year in Easter, kind of really stupid specificity, they actually thought it was more likely or like a flash flood washing away their car next winter. They'd be like, oh, I could actually see that happening. And it makes no sense because broadly the term of active nature covers all catastrophic acts of nature and was more flexible on the date but having a more specific time period when like certain sorts of events happen like a hurricane season or whatever describing the details of what would happen the person could very clearly see the story in their head of it happening and so the statistical likelihood that they thought it would happen became much much stronger so if you're catastrophizing what you're doing is you're adding a lot of detail to the scenario that you don't want to happen and because you've put so much detail into it, it feels very realistic. So because of the detail that you've added to the scenario, the very nature of having details in the story is the thing that makes it feel real. So you end up over believing the situation because you've given it so much details. The magnifying effect blinds you to the real statistics and the actual realistic possibilities in front of you. So you have a very unbalanced idea of what could be happening. A second really important psychological effect here is the human tendency to just invent stories all the time. So I mentioned this at the start, but we're constantly explaining the whole world around us to make ourselves just feel better. This can be a problem, especially when we start confabulating. And confabulating is the art of creating explanations that you believe to be true. Con means put together, also means trick. Fabulate means story or fable. So confabulate means to put together a story. And if you don't know why you did something, or if you don't know what's going to happen, you need a story that you can believe, and your subconscious will create a theory that you can accept as a fact. Now, if we look at humans in the lab, we'll see the really interesting study on split brain patients where they have a disconnect between their right and left hemispheres, meaning sort of stimulations on one side. So if you stimulate one side of the body, they won't know why it's happening from the other side of the body. What researchers did was they'd ask a participant to start walking and they'd ask them in just one ear. And so the participant will start walking. 
And then in the other ear, the research will ask them why they're walking. And the patient will instantly reply with something like, oh, I just wanted to get a drink. And they will believe their story. A similar example would be a researcher showing them a question into one eye where they will ask them to close a window. The patient will get up and close the window. And then the researcher will show the other eye a question which asks the patient why they closed the window. And the patient will confidently say, oh, I, I was cold. The examiners noted that the patients genuinely believed these stories that they just invented. They thought that their story was completely true. They had no idea they'd made it up. They weren't uncertain. And that just shows how seamlessly and quickly we'll just invent a story, the first thing that we can believe. And we need to feel like we behave sensibly. And we also need to feel like we know what's going on in our life in the future. We don't like uncertainty. This works so powerfully that we will confabulate ideas to protect ourselves and we will blind ourselves from the truth or the possibilities of reality. We rationalize ourselves into pretty much the first logical reason that we think of and that we can believe is true. And as soon as we find something that we can believe is true, we will then believe that. And if you're prone to catastrophizing, the first thing you'll do is make a story that is kind of catastrophic and then you'll believe that without thinking about all the other possibilities. So acknowledging this, instead of coming up with explanations or asking people for their explanations for what's going to happen, we should just doubt <laughs> and just get curious about what could happen and think about the positives as well as just the negatives. And our catastrophic stories are just the default story that we pay attention to and believe. It has nothing to do with reality. It's a story about the future that is inherently unknowable. So I want to break down some like more alternative ways that catastrophizing can appear and some of the tools with which you can help stop it happening and mitigate the effects. An interesting area is ADHD. I like this example because I have ADHD and I've also seen some of the problems that people face when they first find out about having it or thinking that they have it because it does really relate to catastrophizing. And despite the setbacks of ADHD, it also has a lot of positives, but people completely blind themselves to this part of it. So ADHD is a neurodevelopmental disorder, which sounds like an illness from the start. It affects children and adults. It's characterized by the persistent patterns of inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and are more frequent and severe than typically observed in individuals at a comparable level of development. Now, that sounds like an affliction of being really terrible and useless. And Lately, rates of ADHD have increased by 30% over the last eight years, and studies show that over 20% of people diagnosed with ADHD might actually have a misdiagnosis. There was a really interesting YouTube of someone who didn't have ADHD who managed to get himself diagnosed with ADHD three times by three different private practices. So it is very easy to get misdiagnosed with ADHD if you were to catastrophize about your ability to pay attention lately, and that would just make your life worse, like hands down. Because if you were to diagnose yourself incorrectly and end up on drugs and thinking ideas about yourself that aren't true, it's not really going to help you. And even if you do have ADHD, by the way, it isn't the end of the world. Now, yes, people with ADHD generally do have problems focusing or paying attention, but rather it's a difficulty focusing on things that they just don't enjoy. And the converse of that is that individuals with ADHD can find things that they truly enjoy and focus on them better than someone without ADHD. And that can lead to a perspective shift because ADHD is not necessarily a deficit, but actually potentially a superpower. If you're someone with ADHD, you could instead think about leveraging your heightened focus on areas that you're passionate about and effectively turn what's usually seen as a drawback into an advantage. Now, if you're catastrophizing, you might seek the diagnosis for ADHD. And then if you do get it, feel like you'll never be able to work again properly. A lot of people get depressed after being diagnosed with ADHD and it can actually turn you into being someone way less effective just because you believe that you can't do anything. It's the opposite of the truth and it's just really unhelpful. Technically, being diagnosed with ADHD, if you have it, is liberating because it means that you have a better ability to focus on things that you enjoy so you can just focus on doing stuff you enjoy and have a nicer life because you're doing things you enjoy. Like, that's great. So you can reframe a story of difficulty and weakness into one of strength and potential. And that's really huge and important for ADHD or whatever else you might be catastrophizing about. So one of the really important aspects in catastrophizing is 
the difference between worst and best scenarios and like making sure you're balancing them. Because in any situation, we should really make sure we pay attention to the best case scenario as well as the worst. As I've mentioned, we tell ourselves very detailed stories about the worst case, which makes us believe them and then we ignore the best case. Instead, we want to reframe our mindset to one that is more optimistic, which can help make us believe the possibility of the positive outcomes and give us a more balanced overall set of emotions around the feeling and then a more balanced set of behaviors to come from them. Catastrophizing is basically habitually thinking about the worst case scenario whenever you're faced with a stress or a challenge. And that's very counterproductive, which it just leads to more anxiety and stress, leads to feelings of helplessness, and can lead to just general destructive behaviors that make the catastrophe more likely to happen. So by focusing on the possible best case scenario in the same situation, we really empower ourselves to actually feel more confident and happy and not be so stressed. If you imagine someone with social anxiety and they had to dread going to the mall, for example, because they've worried that they might have a panic attack, they should really try to imagine a situation where they go to the mall and they keep their anxiety under control. Imagine having a pleasant experience and that can really help them feel more confident about going to the mall and expecting to have a good scenario. Because if you're expecting to have a panic attack, you're more likely to have one. I think in any kind of negative behavior or just anything that you're trying to do, if you're like sort of overshooting in one direction, it's very important to overbalance in the other direction. Imagine you go bowling and the ball always kind of goes to the left of where you're aiming. You're aiming for the center, right? You're not going to carry on aiming for the center. What you need to do is you need to over aim to the right to make it actually land in the center. So if you're prone to negative thinking, you need to over aim positively and actually come up with the sort of flowers and unicorns examples of what could actually happen in the future to give yourself what is ultimately a balanced worldview of what could be happening. Because if you're like trying to counteract your negative behavior with like just some realistic scenarios, like they're not going to be that balanced overall of what you're still imagining. So you need to have some like, oh my God, if you're worried about going to the mall, you maybe need to imagine going to the mall and having the best day of your life and it being totally wonderful and brilliant. And overall, you're then going to have a feeling of just an average trip to the mall for anyone else. It sounds a bit silly, but like it's just how your brain works and it's sort of what you need to do. Ultimately in life, the best and worst case scenarios usually don't happen and things fall in between. By practicing the act of visualizing positive outcomes, you can equip yourself to have a more balanced view of the future, which will significantly reduce the feelings of anxiety or stress for any potential catastrophe that you are thinking about. A useful way to do this is to journal and whatever it is that you're worried about, make sure you try and write down lots of good things that you could think about as well. And also perhaps just talking to someone, being open about the fact that you can often be negative and catastrophize about things and wanting some ideas on like the positive sides of stuff. And then ultimately therapy and CBT are like hugely helpful with this. More on that later, we're going to go into the next technique, which is the want and don't want chair. And this one's really cool. So you see this a lot in psychology, but also in sales, which I think is a nice example because it shows the power of stories and the power of working with your mind. When people are asked about what they want, it's actually often hard for them to say what it is that they want. And it's much easier for them to give a list of things that they don't want. They just have a tendency towards a negative. Now, whether this is about like a potential partner, what they want are the qualities of a pet or starting an exercise habit, the bits that you don't want to deal with, they just come to mind so easily. So if you're talking to customers about trying to sell them a gym subscription, they're going to come up with ideas like, oh, I don't have the right gear i don't know what food to buy for my diet i'm like worried about like how people will look i don't know how to use the machines like it's easy for them to come up with reasons why they won't do it and it's much harder for them to come up with actually all the positive reasons besides just like my health it'll be nice so when alex hormozy was selling gym subscriptions he developed a very comprehensive set of all the different reasons that people might refuse a gym subscription like all those things and then he just built a solution for each one of them. So whenever they had a problem, he was like, all right, we've solved this problem for you as well, as well as that problem. So whatever argument they had against doing it, he'd always be able to solve it. That way he'd become like a massively successful millionaire who will soon be a billionaire apparently. It just shows that the power of realizing that people are super negative can make you super rich. Now, obviously this isn't about getting super rich, but it shows the power of reframing negatives into positive and learning to work with that can really just lead to positive outcomes in your life. More on the psychological side is the concept of the want and don't want chair. Now, psychologists found when they ask people about a certain situation or like their life, 
if they sat them in the don't want chair, they would very easily say all the things that they don't want in life of like the problems that they might have to deal with that they really want to avoid. Whereas if they sat them in the want chair, they would quickly start actually framing the things they want by saying things they don't want again. They just found it very hard to actually say things that they want in life. People find it much easier to articulate things that they want to avoid and like problems of discomfort than they actually understand what they want or positive things. It's much easier for people to imagine and articulate things that cause them discomfort and that they want to avoid than things that they actually seek because humans just have a tendency towards the negative. It's part of what keeps us alive and protects us is avoiding the bad things like the good things doesn't really matter <laughs> as long as we don't die which is evolutionarily useful but again not useful sometimes. The ultimate aim of the exercise for sitting in the want chair or the don't want chair is to really help encourage individuals to focus on more of their wants and realize also how hard it is for them and once you start getting better at it you can think about your goals aspirations and the positive outcomes it just doesn't come so naturally to you but once you do that it is more likely to manifest in your life so consciously shifting your focus towards more positive desires can really cultivate just a more positive outlook and really help you manage any tendencies you have for catastrophizing and also just help increase your self-awareness to promote and build a more solution orientated mindset which actually isn't that natural for most humans you don't need a psychologist to literally sit you in a chair and say it's the don't want chair and another chair for the want chair you can just use it as a mental model to remind yourself about these thinking patterns but if you want you can have a hat at home that you call the want hat, etc. Or sit in a chair or even have something that you just hold like that you can pass around. And when you have it, you're only allowed to talk about things that you do want and talk positively and not allowed to say anything negative. And I think a visual cue like that can actually be very helpful. It's dumb, but it's kind of cute and powerful. So we've covered quite a few different ideas. So now let's go into the four, four step method for mitigating catastrophization. It all starts with awareness, as I said before. It's crucial to recognize when you might be feeling down or upset and leaning into catastrophe and really attribute those negative patterns to just detrimental thinking. And that is really not easy. Our thought patterns operate under the radar of conscious behavior, which is why I've tried to give so much explanation leading up to this. But paying closer attention to our emotional state, connecting with those feelings, connecting with our thoughts, we can really start to catch those negative patterns as they arise. I would highly suggest journaling and like actually expanding on things when you are feeling worried about something. And I'd also really suggest talking to someone who's a good listener about how catastrophizing appears in your life and just kind of get a better overview. So like list out the times when you usually do it. Try and think about when it might be more likely to happen. Also, any other things that might contribute, like does it happen more often when you're tired or when you're hungry? And like what are the scenarios that might increase it just the more awareness that you build the more likely you're able to catch yourself and then start being able to have like more positive outcomes the second step is challenging the thought which is why you need awareness because you can't challenge it unless you've become aware of it now that the negative thought pattern has been identified it's important to then question how valid it is now this could involve doing some reality checking of the negative prediction like how likely is that worst case scenario really to happen like genuinely like give it a statistic and then consider other potential outcomes like analyze evidence that you have for it happening and not happening and any other contradictory thoughts you could think of and the goal is to just break up that automatic assumption that you have between a situation and a catastrophic thought and replace it with just a more rational and more balanced perspective then, like I said, imagining the best, you really need to counterbalance that tendency towards negativity with a positive opposite outcome. As I said, with the bowling example, if you're always shooting left, you need to actually aim to the right to end up in the center. If you're always being negative, you do need to have some like very positive thoughts to keep you kind of more balanced and aware. This way you can shift your mindset away from like just negativity, fear, anxiety towards more hopeful, motivating ideas that will actually just make you happier and more excited for anything to happen and then finally step four is actually becoming more comfortable with uncertainty accepting uncertainty because ultimately everything in the future is uncertain and uncertainty is just part of life and being a human the reason that many people catastrophize is that they're just uncomfortable with the uncertainty of what might be happening and they don't like not knowing what's going to happen and so they'll just 
tend towards something negative because it'll come up with ways to protect themselves. Whereas if you just become more comfortable with the concept that like you've no idea if something's going to be good or bad, you can be happier with playing the statistics of life that like sometimes some bad things will happen and it'll be counteracted by many good things and just take them as they come and go rather than always obsessing about the bad thing in every single opportunity in front of you because then you'll miss all the opportunities. So you really do need to learn how to tolerate uncertainty and even embrace it to actually become successful and happier. It's really hard. <laughs> I'll just be clear. You might want to do this gradually. Like this involves some, like, some smaller exposures to uncertainty, just taking small steps towards the things that you want, despite knowing that there are some unknowns. And over time, this can help just reduce your fears, your avoidance behaviors, and help you become more comfortable with ambiguity that is always going to be there. I know like how hard this is and also how frustrating it is to watch people who find it really easy in something that we don't find easy. So like whether it's like traveling to like exotic places and doing crazy stuff or starting a business, like some people just seem to do it all the time and other people are like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and it's okay. Just take small steps on whatever the thing is that scares you and don't judge yourself. Ultimately, the better you get at overcoming your fears, the easier you will find it to stop catastrophizing. And it's very much relates to growth mindset because catastrophizing literally is the opposite of growth mindset. It's a fixed mindset approach. To grow the level of your comfort zone, you have to step out of it and do things that make you uncomfortable. And that is part of having a growth mindset. So if you listen to this podcast, it's probably going to help. So those were the four steps. And I did say I would mention therapy and CBT. So cognitive behavioral therapy is one of the approaches often used to treat cognitive distortion. That can be catastrophizing. It can also be anxiety, depression, and ADHD, by the way. And it really works by helping people identify and challenge their harmful thought patterns and replacing them with more realistic ones. CBT is very much based on the focus of the relationship between thoughts and how our feelings affect our behaviors. Because catastrophizing is just a thought process which affects how we feel and it drives our behaviors. If you can observe your thought patterns and really understand why they create the feelings they create and why the behavior that come out of that are bad, you'll then become better at dealing with them. So identifying and challenging those negative patterns can really help change your thoughts and improve your life. In CBT, you might do some things such as reality testing to actually find evidence that will support any ideas that you have and support like more positive outcomes instead to really give you some more perspective. You'll also do things like cognitive restructuring, which sounds like brain surgery, but actually it's just a, an important technique to just identify and dispute irrational thoughts that often come up and try and replace harmful ideas with more balanced and rational ones. You also get to do behavioral experiments and these will be designed to challenge any negative beliefs that you hold and actually confirm the more realistic ones. So like I said, with like the social situation, you might be encouraged to attend an event and observe what happens and the outcome and just test your predictions versus the actual reality. Another important aspect of CBT is mindful acceptance. It relates a lot to the stoic concepts that I've been speaking about on the show and basically being mindful of negative thoughts and situations and just becoming comfortable with accepting them by not giving any judgment or thought to it can help us avoid the, the feeling of anxiety and the need to react. And that will really help us deal with uncertainty and discomfort inherent in life so that it'll no longer scare us. A very important final part is just skills training, which will vary a lot on the individual and the situations they're trying to deal with. And you'll be taught different techniques that might help you with stress management, relaxation training, problem solving skills. Whichever ones you learn will be to do with managing any emotional responses that you have to cope more effectively with the situations that you're in. I've gone into this because it actually is really important for people to understand why they might go and do CBT and why it might help. I did it myself. I really can't recommend it enough. It was super, super useful to have CBT. I did it more for ADHD rather than catastrophizing, but it really helped change my approach. And I've really seen it help other people with depression, anxiety, and catastrophizing. Now, by way of a mini advert, I will talk about BetterHelp, the online therapy website where you can find your own therapist with exactly the right specialized skills for whatever your situation is. I've used them myself and they were super, super good. So if you do want to look into therapy or CBT, I would recommend it. You can go to betterhelp.com slash growth mindset for 10% off therapy there. Other therapy providers, of course, exist. And either way, I hope the tools and ideas in this episode will help you start making some headway to catastrophize less and of course complain less as is the topic of the series and enjoy your life more. 
Remember, in summary, catastrophizing is just a distortion of reality that can genuinely lead to making your life worse, and it is important to deal with it and recognize it by focusing on awareness of the situations where it arises, challenging the negative thought patterns, imagining the best possible outcomes instead to balance the thought patterns, and becoming more aware that life is uncertain and accepting that. So if you think this helped you, or it could help someone else, please share it with a friend. And if you felt like leaving me a review, that could help me stop catastrophizing about what I should do with my life, and that would be lovely. Remember, life is about enjoying yourself, which starts with enjoying today, so be kind to yourself, and whilst you're at it, be kind to someone else too. Thank you for listening.